Where were you born? And uh, in the country, in southern Indiana, the nearest little town of about a hundred people was Frenchtown, Indiana. So we were definitely out in the country. So what is your full name? Denzel Ray Smith. Now, did any of that name, was that a special name? Were you named for someone or was there a story behind your name at all? I'm not sure. I think my mother was just having a bad day (laughs) and named me all of that. How many siblings did you have? Five. And I made six. (laughs) So what would you say is your favorite childhood memory? You think about your childhood. What's one that stands out as a good memory? The greatest day, the greatest night of my life was when our family went to an old-fashioned camp meeting on a Friday night invited by a neighbor And when the altar call was given, and I didn't know what an altar call was, but I watched my dad and mom walk down the aisle to the altar. And I didn't know what they were going for. I was sitting on the back seat, as far back as you could get with a girl. Uh, It wasn't a girlfriend, it was just a friend. But I thought, well, if they're going down there, I probably ought to go too. I was 13. Okay. And when I did go down there and kneel, an elderly man came by an altar worker. Mm -hmm. And he said, young man, why are you here at the altar? I said, I don't have a clue. (laughs) He said, well, are you a Christian? I said, I don't think so. He said, well, would you like to be a Christian? I said, I would. Now, our family had attended church all of our lives, from babies up, but it was not an evangelical church, and they did not give altar calls. Mm -hmm. So this was my first acquaintance with um, the altar call. And this camp meeting that night, there were probably 700 people. And it was hot. (laughs) It was August the 7th, 1951. Wow. But it was the greatest night of my life. Did things for your family change after that? They did. As a matter of fact, Um, My dad said to my mom, not in a mean or unkind way, but he said, um, if we're going to do this church thing, let's do it right. Well, and back in that day, what that meant, we went to Sunday school on Sunday morning. That was followed by morning worship. Mm -hmm. We were back on Sunday night. (laughs) <laughs> we were back on Wednesday night for midweek prayer. We had a lot of church, and uh, actually it was good, and we were having fun. I had a hot temper, mm. a quick anger. I was a liar, a cheater, and a thief. And after I got saved, I heard the word restitution. Hmm. So I went back to my aunt. I had stolen from her, apologized, offered to give the money back. I had stolen from a five and ten cents store they used to call then. (laughs) And uh, I took that back. And... uh, There were several restitutions that I need to make, and they were all difficult, but I did it. And I said, God, I'm an awful person. 
And I even had thoughts, probably from Satan, of suicide. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to hurt me, so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> that was 12 years of age that I need some definite help. And one year later, that help came in the form of that camp meeting. Mm -hmm. Because not only was my life changed, my dad and mom, brothers and sisters, uh, actually, we all were converted the same night. At that point in your life, did you have any plans for what you would want to grow up to be? No. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about today. People would ask me as a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, nothing. <laughs> uh, I had such a good home life and farm life and everything. I didn't particularly want to grow up, <laughs> but I didn't know what I was supposed to do or wanted to do. So when did that change? How did you? That changed at about the age of 19 at Evansville, Indiana. There was a lady missionary there at the church, North Side Church of the Nazarene. They gave an altar call. <laughs> Well, I was familiar with that, so I went to the altar for this reason. I knew a lot of older people that were happy Christians, and they were living on a different level, a different plane than I was. Mm. So I went to the altar that night, and I said, God, I'm going to stay at this altar tonight until I understand what these people have that I don't. Mm. And I prayed at that altar for an hour and a half and sobbed my heart out. And my future wife and my future mother-in-law, one on each side, and I prayed till I got to the point. I said, okay, God, I'll do anything. And I opened my big mouth, <laughs> and I didn't really mean anything, mm -hmm. everything. Right. But uh, God took advantage of me, and he said, that's good. I want you to be a preacher. And I said, under my breath, you're kidding. He said, you're right. You're going to need a lot of help, and you're going to need to pray a lot. Yeah. And that was true. So I have prayed a lot in my life to serve the Lord, please the Lord, serve the church right. of the living God. Now, you mentioned that your wife and um, future wife and mother-in-law were there. How had you met your wife? At a Halloween party. Oh. <laughs> what kind of Halloween party was it? Well, it was nice. It was nice. Was it a costume kind of party or just a... Yeah, it sort of, sort of was, but I didn't have a costume. <laughs> I just sort of drifted in and out. Did she have a costume? I don't remember. But you I met, don't think so. You met at that party. Um, this is our faces. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what what you get. Yeah. What about her made you want to get to know her better? Well, really, it, it was she. Uh, I sort of didn't have any choice. She wanted to get to know you better. She was talking to the pastor's wife there and her mother, and um, she overheard her mother and the pastor's wife discussing me. Mm. And I was still at Corridan, Indiana, 
but um, she she said, my future wife, she said, I'm going to meet him and marry him. So I didn't have a choice. Why were you willing to get married to her? Like, what about her character at that point? Obviously, you didn't well, know her as well as you do uh, now. But. She was beautiful. She was educated, a nice dresser, and uh, very smart. And I did not want to marry a dumbbell. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you've been married, how, how many years have you been married? Well, I think around 63. So now that you've been married for over six decades, what would you say is your favorite thing about her now? Well, she's still attractive. She's still smart. And uh, she is a help to me. Mm-hmm. She's a help to me. Now, you guys have had some hard seasons in your marriage. We have. What would you say is the best piece of advice you would have for someone just starting out in marriage? Well, I would say the power of a promise. Hmm. I was taught by my dad and mom, when you make a promise, my dad said, your promise is your word, mm -hmm. your character. A promise is the real you. Mm -hmm. So the vows we took at the Church of the Nazarene in Cordon, Indiana, I promised forever. Until death, us do part. In this stage of your life, what are some of the benefits you have because you were able to make it through those hard seasons? In many ways, we need one another now more than ever. Yeah. The children are gone. I'm over 80 years of age. And she's early 80s. We need one another. We need somebody to watch over us, as the song, love song, says. Right. So we love one another, but we need one another. I know you could tell us a lot of stories of ways that God has provided for you. Yes. What's one story that you feel like is just a really special way that you saw him show up? And provide for you and meet a need? Well, one time early <laughs> in our marriage, early, uh, and we were away at Trevecca Nazarene College, uh, my wife was having some issues where her, her, her blood wasn't like it should be. It needed more iron and it and the doctor said, she needs to be eating steak. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at that time, maybe we were making $50 a week or something between us. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But there was no way we could buy steak. But we lived in a duplex. Ironically, the man was a meat manager at Kroger. <laughs> and he brought us steak wow. to eat for as long as we needed it. Wow. That was one of the first things that was very remarkable. I think one of the things that I and other people have noticed about you over the years is that you are not an easily offended person. What no. would you say is your secret to not getting offended? Well, one thing, my dad and mom, especially my dad, said just receive people as they are. Whatever they are, just receive them. 
And then the example that Jesus gave, you accept people like he accepts us. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really easy in a way because I had so many problems and sins when I came to the Lord and lying, cheating, stealing, wheeling, dealing, <laughs> just anything bad and mean. When I thought about my sins, I said, I can forgive them. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. I'll, I'll just let it go. I'll just let it go. At school, I was the butt of a lot of jokes and laughing and everything. And I found out when people made fun of me and laughed, if I would laugh with them, <laughs> it took the sting out mm -hmm. and it wasn't funny for them anymore. <laughs> so they, they stopped it. Yeah, that's true. Do you feel like you have a pretty good sense of humor? Yes. <laughs> what would you say is one of your favorite things about Jesus as you've known him for so many years of your life? What do you, what's something really special to you about Jesus? His mercy. Mm -hmm. His mercy. I think it's one of the greatest attributes that we can have. Every Christian has received mercy. I've been receiving his mercy over 60 years. Mm -hmm. How can I be unmerciful with somebody else? Yeah. If you think just a little bit, uh, I owe mercy to others. I said, God, what's the plan that you have for me the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. He said, be a good example and a godly influence mm -hmm. over others. Yeah. In other words, don't fail. Don't fail people. You, you may want to remember this. You never want to give up on God because he never gives up on you. Yeah. So, That's and true. your dad has preached so well, when the going gets rough, press in. Mm. Press into God. You don't run away when bad things happen. You don't leave the church and leave God. That's the dumbest thing you can really do. <laughs> you press in. You ask people to pray for you. You stay in the group. Mm -hmm. Stay in the church. Yeah. Stay with the congregation. You need friends. And what is one wise thing you have learned over your life that you would share with those younger than yourself? I was walking and praying one day here in the neighborhood. And the Lord gave me this great thought. He said, you know, you owe everything that you know and have ever learned to other people. Mm. And he explained it. He said, your parents, yeah. teachers, preachers, evangelists, seminars. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, this self-made man or woman is a hoax, but it's God and others that have poured in to our lives. Mm -hmm. So we owe others. I have a a little paper that in my counseling. Um, the article was, What's so great about gratitude? Well, it's one of the greatest virtues that God ever gave to mankind. Mm. We need to be saying thank you a lot. Yes. And to a lot of people, mm -hmm. we owe thanksgiving to God and others. What is your favorite thing about yourself? <laughs> or what is your best quality? Well, I think a sense of humor 
serves any of us well. And I think you'll do better in any relationship, even if you're single, relationship to you, uh, marriage, family, church, anything. And every day there's something that is rather amusing, <laughs> funny, hilarious. Uh, and I tell people, if you don't know of anything funny, go look in the mirror. <laughs> What's something that you hope that your children and grandchildren remember you for? Well, I was thinking about that the other day, and I wrote down in a day timer, if they could honestly say he was a good and godly man. That would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are grateful for the chance to get to know a little bit more about you. And I know that everyone will enjoy this experience. So I, I'm going to ask you to do one last thing. Would you just pray over those who are going to get to watch this? Sure. Okay. Father God, thank you for loving us. Your love, your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, your healing. You are complete, and we worship you. We serve you. We bow to you. We acknowledge and recognize you as the God of all and everything that we will ever need. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. And the songwriter said, To God be the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.